How's your English? How's your German? <laughs> Excellent response. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's awful. <laughs> Don't know anything in German. Uh, but uh, I'm asking because uh, I don't speak any German. I, I hope this uh, I hope this comes out okay. Uh, if you do have a copy of the story mapping book here. There is a German edition. German was one of the first languages it was translated into. Um, and uh, oddly, it, I don't know. The, the book is selling pretty well, but uh, and I can watch the sales on Amazon.com. But this book sells more on Amazon.de or you know Amazon's uh, um, Amazon in Germany than it does in Amazon in the U.S. So it's, uh, there are more Germans that have this book than America, and it actually it sells pretty well in America too. So I don't know where they all are. A lot of them. Somewhere. Uh, uh, my name is Jeff Patton. Thank you for coming on such a short notice to this. It's kind of my fault for being uh, wishy-washy about, uh, the, I think Mitch brought up, uh, do you want to do a talk? I said, oh, I've got two classes. I don't know if I want to do a talk at night. And I, and I didn't answer him. Uh, and so we didn't answer until I got here. Thanks for coming with maybe 24 hours notice. Uh, for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Jeff Patton. I've been uh, around in the Agile community for a long time. I've been in software development for a little over 20 years, 20, getting close to 25 now, I think. Uh, I started with Agile development very early on and very accidentally. I worked at a product company uh, for over, a little over 10 years and I was getting frustrated with the way we worked and I wanted to look for something different and uh, I left my company and one of the executives of my company also left and he started at this cool startup in San Francisco, California and this startup was using this cool new process called extreme programming. They'd hired this guy named Kent Beck who had written this book called Extreme Programming Explained and he was coming to the company and to, 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 this was going to be the secret weapon for this startup. They were going to use this, process, this XP process. And uh, I was hired there as a product manager and uh, I was first told that we're going to use these, these things called user stories uh, to document our... We're going to use user stories to describe what we're building. First off, I thought that was a pretty stupid name. Um, how many people here are, are using stories in your work right now? Uh, it's pretty much almost everybody, if not everybody. When I first heard the term stories, I thought that's a pretty stupid name. I, we're, build, we're building important things here. This is critical. We're trying to get a company up and running to call what we're doing stories or fairy tales or fabrications or uh, anything else seems stupid. Uh, why would we use that term? It has taken me over a, a decade to really figure out what stories mean. And if you're new to them or getting this, I, hopefully I can shave at least five years off of your learning time. Um, we're going to, uh, before I can talk about story mapping, look, that's a story map. It's a dead simple idea. Uh, if I'm trying to tell a story, a big story, I, uh, if I were to tell a story about uh, what you do, I would tell that story step by step. Uh, first you do this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and we kind of build a, a row. And just uh, build a row of, uh, of, of sh these short phrases that tell a story. And then if that story is about something that people would do in our software, we kind of break it down or uh, figure out what the details are under each step. That helps us figure out what to build. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> um, but the, the, because the story mapping isn't any more complicated than that. But uh, one of the things that go horribly wrong is the whole stories thing. Now I'm going to switch back and forth between doing things and drawing things. There's all that stuff all over the wall back there because I just taught a two-day class and when I'm teaching two days. I I don't use a lot of slides. I skip a lot of slides. So I'll do a lot of a lot of hand drawing. First thing I want to make clear to everybody is, well, uh, I've been using stories since the year 2000. The term Agile was coined in 2001, and Agile was coined as a wrapper term uh, that included Scrum and extreme programming and a bunch of other things. 
These days, a lot of people who learn Scrum also learn user stories, and they don't know they came from extreme programming, that originally Scrum didn't use those story things. Uh, but stories have gone completely sideways or completely wrong since almost the very beginning. People have forgotten what they're really for. So look, I want to tell you that stories, um, well, stories are meant to solve two problems uh, in software development. And what's interesting is neither problem, well, neither are about writing better requirements. The first problem, well, I'll, I'll give you the two problems here. Look, the, the first problem is that documents, the, the way we write any kinds of requirements, that's why stories aren't a better way to write requirements, documents just don't, don't work, at least not the way you think they do. The other problem stories are meant to solve is, look, there is always, always too much to build. Let's start with the documents don't work part of it. Hey, who here has read the story mapping book before? It's, this is the, the, you've heard all this before. Uh, uh, yeah, you can, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's the same stuff. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I'll see if there's anything else to in there. But, uh, it's just the live version. Uh, you, uh, that's it. Uh, look, then imagine. Then uh, say again. The, then they make a music version. Yes, <laughs> actually, I uh, should work on that. Except I sing so poorly. Uh, <laughs> I play kazoo really well. But, yeah. All right. Uh, so imagine someone at your office is uh, leaving, and they're holding a going away party. And it's your job to call and order the cake. You call a bakery. The bakery says, great, we can make the cake you want. Uh, what would you like us to write on the cake? And you say, well, can you write on it so long, Alicia, in purple, and put stars around it? You, you, they write it down. You go, you pick up the cake, and this is what you get. This is exact, it's like exactly meets your requirements. It's exactly what you said you wanted. This is a cake from a website called Cake Rex. Yes, that's really a website. It gets millions of visitors a month. I thought it was a silly little thing, but it's got a lot of traffic. This is the cover of the author's first book. Uh, what's funny are the, she gets a lot of weird, how would you get so many weird cake pictures? But you can. Um, and her writing is really good, but, and there's a lot of different types of weird cakes. Uh, some that are uh, not, cakes you want to show to your children and uh, the other things. So you should spend time there. But one of the underlying themes is these things of misinterpreted or literally interpreted instructions. So you can see what's wrong with that cake. So look, you have to hear English and be able to read English to make these make <laughs> sense. Um, you see what went wrong there? Makes sense. Okay, there are a lot of examples of literally interpreted or misinterpreted instructions. <laughs> <laughs> This, this, this means we don't have sprinkles. There are examples in software. This is called a non-functional requirement. <laughs> there are, uh, there are, you can spend many hours. I'm not going to show you many more. Uh, and these are all pretty silly. You would think, oh, I've got to look, these are stupid. Anyone who actually read that and wrote that on a cake was just not doing their job well or just being mean to the people who wrote the instructions. But if you've been in software development very long, you probably got situations where you wrote something down, you told somebody, they said, I get it, you hand it to them, and then you've been really surprised at what came back. Uh, you know, you can see when it comes back that they absolutely did not get it. Uh, those are uh, 10 and 20 dollar mistakes uh, in the US, 10 or 20 euro mistakes. This is the 100, there are a lot of real mistakes. This is a 125 million dollar mistake. Uh, this. This is way back in 1999. NASA marched something, launched something called the Mars Climate Orbiter. The stupidest thing about it was its name, because the only thing it could not do is orbit. 
it flew directly to Mars and then crashed directly into Mars. <laughs> and uh, there were two software teams writing guidance software for it, and they were exchanging documents <laughs> uh, explaining how their interfaces worked. It's just that one team was re using English units and one team was using metric units. They could both point to each other saying, hey, you read our documents, right? And uh, the, the conversions were supposed to be happening and weren't happening. It took them a long time to figure out what the, the problem was, and people can argue it should have been tested or it should have been checked some way, but uh, they were small calculation errors. Just between the distance between Earth and Mars, small calculation errors add up. The problem, the underlying problem is, well, it's this documents don't work problem. The idea that we may all read the same document, we all, may all sign off on it, we may all nod and say, yep, I get it, uh, I uh, no problem, I understand, but we're all imagining very different things. So, look, uh, I'm waiting for the picture to be taken. But <laughs> that is Kent Beck, a little shot of Kent Beck. He's got this disruptively simple idea to fix all problems that ever existed with documents, um, and that's to just stop it. Uh, just to stop exchanging documents and tell me your story. Now, his clever idea goes like this. This is super sophisticated. If you've got something that you want, write it down on a card. And because it's a card, it's really small and you can't write down very much. And what's interesting is it does not matter what you write or how much you write or if it's in any particular format, you just write it down. Because you're going to get together with somebody who knows how to build stuff and together you are going to talk. You're going to tell your story and together in that conversation you'll figure out what needs to be built. Stories get their name from how they're meant to be used, not how we write them. Now, uh, that's it. That's all there is to stories. Uh, so I've already told you, look, we've only been into this for a few minutes, and I've all, already explained stories and story mapping to you. And we can all go now. Uh, but the problem is, in agile development, and in people still manage to screw that super simple idea up. How many of you are in environments where you're using uh, uh, using Scrum uh, to do things. How many are using something, keep your hand up if you're using backlog grooming or backlog refinement sessions? Okay, so look, this is, these days, because Scrum didn't originally have stories, and the stories uh, came in the Scrum light. You, people used to use, they were called backlog items, and uh, in theory, uh, there's a lot of things, and we can talk after the fact about how Scrum and uh, XP and things have kind of changed and merged over time, but uh, the, the story practice didn't exist originally, uh, didn't exist originally in Scrum. But so we've kind of repurposed a, a meeting in Scrum called a backlog grooming meeting, and look, this is how they normally go. This is how I see them. We, we tail the team to show up, they've all got to be there, they're not happy, they complain the meeting lasts too long. We project JIRA on the wall, and uh, maybe two or three people are actually interested in what's going on. Everyone else is kind of pretending to be interested. People believe that if they use their smartphones under the table, we will not notice. The, they'll say, We're, I'm doing super important stuff on Facebook and uh, stuff like that. And I have a lot of pictures of people in backlog grooming sessions and I'm surprised that there are often people yawning and actually people completely asleep. Uh, when we talk about working together and having good conversations, that's not at all what Kemp was talking about. When we have these conversations, there's something special going on. Yes, we talked about, well, look, it, we may, it's not just talking, actually. It, in fact, if we just talk, and if, or even worse, if one person talks and everyone else just listens, that may be true right now. I'm saying words to you, but I have no idea what you're really understanding. And uh, you may nod and say you get it. Uh, but it's not until you feed back, not until you explain to me what you understand, and even better than explaining, not until you visualize it, uh, if it's something complex, if you draw pictures or show something to explain what you understand, then we start to really get it. You didn't understand what I understand, and if we've got a conversation between people who understand how to build stuff and people who understand uh, users in the business and people who understand, uh, well, if we've got a diverse group of people, 
it's no surprise that they understand things differently. They see the world differently. And it's not that one is right and one is wrong. One is wrong. It's that to, together, if we combine and refine and put things together, we end up with really a more complete picture. When we leave this conversation, we may still talk about the same story or reference the same feature name or talk about the same customer, but now when we say it, we actually mean the same thing. What we're going for is this kind of intangible state of shared understanding. You can't see it, you can't write it down, you can't sign off on it, it's, we have to feel it. We keep, in traditional software processes, we rely on sharing documents. <coughs> And we believe, well, we treat documents like contracts. And if you sign the contract, uh, then you must have understood. I know that I have credit cards and a home loan, and I have lots of paperwork I've signed that I know I don't understand. Uh, but well, the, the document part, uh, that's not what helps us understand. If we're having effective story conversations, they don't look like that projecting JIRA on the wall thing. They look a lot more like uh, uh, people standing and talking and pointing and gesturing. Look, these are story conversations. I'm going to spill these out. And there's a couple important parts there. On the left-hand side, people are talking about, uh, they're talking about what the software might look like and how it might behave. And they're building shared understanding. And on the right side are examples of people writing bullet points. They're writing acceptance criteria. And it's after they understand how it works, then they can write down short lists of how would we check this to confirm it actually does work that way. It's the conversations on the left that yield the, well, those are acceptance criteria stuff on the right. Now, I'm going to show a, jump one slide here. This is a guy at a company called Atlassian. People know who Atlassian is? How many people use Jira here? Okay, that's a lot. They are kind of the best selling product for doing this. When I walk around most agile environments, agile people are big about using sticky notes and junk on walls. When I walk around Atlassian, they have lots of sticky notes and junk on walls. But at most agile companies, what I see on the walls are things like task boards or burn down charts or things like that. But uh, so at other Agile companies I'd see that, but at Atlassian I don't see any of that. What I, because they have JIRA, they use JIRA for that, and they use task walls on JIRA, and they put backlogs in JIRA, they don't need those on the wall. What they have on the wall are the residue, all the stuff that, that builds up as they talk about stories. What you'll see are, well, on the left, those yellow things are quick and dirty sketches of screens, and they're barely understandable, and lots of bullet points and uh, notes written down as we talked about it. On the right side of that same wall is something that's a little bit more of a mature flow. There are uh, wireframes that have been printed out, and again, like lines drawn all around them, and uh, you can see that they've been talking about it and explaining how things work. <coughs> If I walk around from team to team, I'll see equivalent boards and walls with junk all over them. The picture right there in the middle, they've been having a conversation about the story. And these things on sticky notes, uh, actually those are JIRA tickets. Because they've looked at that screen, they've talked about what's in there, and they said, okay, we should uh, break this down into several different stories. And they write those on there, and they'll photograph that, and somebody will take that and key it into JIRA later. They don't do it projecting JIRA on the wall. This is a team at Atlassian at a stand-up meeting. Instead of going around a circle saying, I worked on this ticket number yesterday and I'm going to work on this ticket number again today, they look, they're standing in front of a flow of the feature they're working on and they point at it and say, I worked on this today. It's interesting that uh, other companies' stand-ups that are using JIRA, I hear JIRA ticket numbers a lot. And when I watch stand-up meetings at Atlassian, I don't hear them reference JIRA ticket numbers very much at all. Now, they're not uh, always standing in front of workflows like this, but they do re usually reference the feature or the screen or the thing they're working on. All these simple, crappy visualiz visualizations that we build are critical. They're, they're important things. They work like vacation photos. Now, if I can explain to you what I mean here, look, those are my two daughters, uh, and we're on vacation in Hawaii. 
Has anybody here been to Hawaii before? Who's been to Hawaii? Yeah, not very many people. Where do you go? <laughs> There's other truck. Oh, look, uh, yeah, in America, I guess you've got a crossover. Oh, yeah, it's not the closest place to get tropical <laughs> for you guys. Uh, okay, so look, uh, when I think of Hawaii, I think of a lush tropical paradise with lots of palm trees and beautiful beaches, things like that. But in fact, there are lots of parts of Hawaii. In fact, the biggest island in Hawaii, the whole west side of the island, is a freaking desert. It's awful. Uh, there's, if you look at those trees, there's kind of scrubby low things. There are no swaying palm trees there. And in fact, that, that big island is super volcanic. Active, volcan active volcanoes on the south side of it. And every beach is either covered with lava rock or if there's any sand at all, it's covered with people. And the beaches were sucking. And on this vacation, my kids just wanted to hang around the hotel pool. I decided we'd spend way too much money to hang around the hotel pool. So I said, we're going to find a beach to go to. I found a beach on TripAdvisor. They said it's really awesome, but it takes a little, it's a little hard to get to. What hard to get to meant was over an hour's drive on a four-wheel drive trail. That was a bad idea in a rental Ford Mustang. We spent a lot of <laughs> racing on rocks and things like that. Um, but by the time we get there, we're all a little sh shaken up because we know we got to do the drive back. Uh, we park in the parking lot. Uh, there's not very many cars there. That's a good sign. We get out of the car. There's no beach. We can't even hear the water. There's a path going across more lava rock. If you have kids, you know how this is going. My kids are begging to please just go back to the hotel pool. And I, as any good father would, I told them, no, we are going to the beach. <laughs> we marched across for another half hour across lava rock. And this is the opening to the beach. That's why there's so many footsteps there. Because when we, everybody has to go in and out there, but you won't see any more people there. There are multiple beaches chained together. There are hardly any people. I think the whole day we saw like 10 other people. There were lots of fish in the water. There were turtles up on the shore. We had a great day. And, uh, uh, and this is us just leaving at the end of the day. Now, I'm not telling you all that to sell you Hawaii. I'm just telling you all that because you wouldn't have known any of that because you weren't there. If I showed you the picture, you could have told me, oh, that looks nice and that looks like fun. But look, if, if you were to look at that picture and read those notes, you could kind of make some sense of it. You're in the software world, you know what's going on there. But I promise you that whatever information you think is there, you don't know a fraction of it because you weren't there. But for the people that were there, this helps them remember. That's the purpose of documents. You'll see this vacation photo effect even when you write a document you think is really good. Mm -hmm. You'll write it really well. Uh, the, you, you may work with somebody else. You'll have them read it. You both agree this document is fabulous. You send it to someone else, and it's a cake rack. Uh, because uh, they weren't there. They can't read between the lines the way that you can. There are things that they miss. So look, um, uh, these effective story conversations are meant to build shared understanding. And the best documents use our words to recall. Uh, well, they help us recall those conversations. They don't replace those conversations. So look, the purpose of these documents, or the purpose of stories, is to re they don't replace the documents. They build on top of documents. Documents don't work well, so well, we use storytelling to build shared understanding. Now, the next thing, the too much to build thing. Hey, I'm taking a long wandering path to get to talking about story mapping. Are you guys okay with this? These are the long ones. Uh, look, I'm going to draw a model that I draw over and over until it's so dead obvious that uh, everybody says not that again. But I'm going to start by telling you what I tell everybody. We get bound up in software development worried about building software. But it is, in fact, software is not the point. When we're building software, your job is not to build software, your job is to change the world. <laughs> this sounds big and scary. Uh, however, I'm not talking about world peace or uh, uh, the refugee crisis in uh, the Eastern Europe. I'm talking, and it's actually the refugees are hitting this country and every other European country. Um, 
We're talking about the corner of the world that you can affect. Uh, the corner of the world where, look, if your company makes a product, the corner of the world where your product is, and I'm talking about the people that may use your product, those are the people that, whose lives you really are affecting. Now, the way this model, model, way this model works is by, uh, we start by looking at the world as it is now. If we look at the people who buy or use your product, uh, we might find people that are unhappy. Now, they, you may not have, a, if you're a startup, you may not have a product in the market, so we look at people we want to be using our product. We'll find people that are unhappy and people that are worse than unhappy, that may be angry and uh, uh, people that may be confused. It's when we look at these people and look at our product, uh, we come up with ideas. Now, in the startup world, these could be ideas for whole new products, but in the existing software uh, world, we think of new features uh, that we can add to make things better. We think of enhancements to make the features we already have better. Uh, or, you know, we can, think, we can call them new capabilities. But look, whatever we call them, we eventually slip into software language and start calling them our requirements. It's important to remember that that word requirement is just a flashy way to say we have great ideas that will help people. That's it. Now, it does not matter what process you use, if you use Agile or Waterfall or some other process, you will build something, hopefully, and something will come out. And that, uh, we have to go forward in time, so that lands in the world later. And what we hope is true is that those people that were unhappy before are happy now. Now, you know, people are different, and some people will be less happy than other people, and there's always some people you just can't please. The, you know, the words I want to add to this, it's everything between the idea and the delivery. The term for that is output. Right, three important terms in this model. That's the first. You know you're talking about output when you talk about products or features or enhancements or capabilities. Uh, look, our backlog is filled with a lot of these things. We know we're worried about output and measuring it. Uh, when we uh, well, when we talk about uh, time and uh, cost or our budget, uh, when we're worried about our schedule, we're measuring output. And in Agile, we'll talk about output by saying velocity, which is how much stuff we get over time. But that is not why we built it. If I were to ask you to think about a product that you love, that you would recommend to someone else, and uh, well. Think about a product you love. Think about something you'd recommend to something else. I can almost promise you won't say, I really love this product because it was delivered on time. Or, I really love this product because it was cheap. Uh, or anything like that. Uh, when we love a product or when, we, when something is working for us, well, look, I want to refer to this stuff that happens after things come out as outcome. That's why it's named that. And how we measure outcome or how we observe it is not by stuff delivered over time, but it's using, we measure behavior change. If you love a product, it might be because you were doing something before that kind of sucked or you weren't doing it because it was too hard to do, but now you've got this product and you do things differently than you used to. Uh, your experience with it is good doing it. Now, if you release a product to the market and nobody uses it, that's output, but that's a, a bad outcome. If you release a product to market and people use it and they hate it, that's a bad outcome. If you release a product to market and people use it and like it, that's a good outcome. That's why we did this. Now, further here, uh, once people use it, we can also start to ask them or measure even more subjectively their satisfaction. Uh, do they like it, but if they don't use it, their satisfaction may be kind of low. Um, and that's how we start to measure this stuff. Now when I draw the model this way, it looks like it is all about making people happy, but it's not. Uh, it's, you're not a nonprofit. Um, 
you've got to get a paycheck, you work for a company that may be getting a paycheck, your company has a, a vision for where it wants to head, it has some strategy for how to get there, uh, it may be using some metrics to measure its success and uh, those metrics may be going up but then they might have gone down recently or they've gone flat and people inside the company are unhappy. Now the first decision they should make is, gosh, which one of our, which of our customers should we pay, be paying closer attention to? Uh, the heart of business strategy is recognizing not what to build, but who to pay attention to. Now if we pay attention to somebody, we understand what their problems are, we add features, we deliver things, and they love it, and they use it. If one person uses our product, that's interesting. If hundreds do, that's better. If thousands or tens of thousands to do, that's really good. Then we start to see it in our business and whatever those <coughs> metrics were, they start to get better. That makes people happy inside the business. And that's what generates this other term I want to use here, and that is impact. We don't measure impact in behavior change. Well, we use words like return on investment or um, uh, things like brand awareness or uh, market share, um, how much market we have versus our competitors. You know, those are the things that end up being really valuable to the organization. But we don't get those things unless we get these things. If people don't buy and use and uh, do those things with our product, we don't get those. Now the real problem, or the one I just said uh, earlier, is the, well, the problem is the, are these stupid ideas. The problem is that everybody has them. Um, these customers have ideas and they will tell us and these stakeholders have ideas and they will tell us and when we ship successful products and we get more customers all that means is they're going to tell us more crap that we should be putting into our product and it gets worse and worse and worse and this causes this big kind of backup sort of thing where we're trying to build more and more and we try to figure out how to build more and more stuff faster but I promise you if you Double the speed that you can build things at, the ideas will come in four times as fast. There's no way to get ahead, just give up right now. That's not the point. Your goal isn't to build more crap faster. In fact, especially if you're in the product side of things, your goal is to figure out how to build less. When you build less, well, what I'm saying is that you need to minimize that output stuff at the same time that you maximize that outcome and impact. Well look, the way we go about doing that, if I rewind, in 1990 I was working for a company that built software for brick and mortar retailers. In fact I was there for 10 years, so I was there for a long time. Uh, when we were young as a company, we only had, I was employee number 38, we grew up to uh, close to 300, uh, and in the early days, I talked directly to my customers and users. I knew that they, uh, when I say they have ideas, I know from talking with a lot of them, I knew my executives had ideas. I had a team, my team had limited, sizes, uh, limited size, I couldn't build everything. I knew that we were just making good choices. So sometimes we'd use all those words, sometimes we'd use requirements, but we didn't think it actually meant they were required. Uh, we knew we were just making good decisions. Now, as our company grew and grew, we added more people, and I was responsible for part of this, part of our product, and a lady came to me one day saying, Jeff, we need you to add these enhancements to the part of the product you're responsible for. I said, great, tell me a little bit about well, which, which of our customers are looking for these things. And she said, well, they're requirements for the next release. And I said, yeah, I get it, and tell me which of our customers need them, and look, who are the users, and what kind of problems do these things solve? And she looked at, looked at me like I was stupid and said, they're requirements. That's when I learned that this word actually means shut up. <laughs> <laughs> now, the person I was talking to actually uh, was mad at me for a lot of other reasons. And a lot of it's because I'm, I was arguing with her a lot about a lot of things. So I uh, can't completely blame her. Uh, but the problem is I was asking her and I was catching her because she did not know. Uh, because she had assumed they were just requirements. Uh, and she had assumed, like a lot of people, that just because it's called a requirement that it actually matches the definition in the dictionary. And, and in fact, they don't. 
Um, you may, you probably have <coughs> know, and you may have learned that if you were look, if you deliver all the requirements, everything that people want, uh, you may still find people are ticked off. You may also have had situations where you deliver just a fraction of what people ask for, and people are thrilled. And so those have. These have nothing to do with what happens out there, or very little to. You've got to deliver something or nothing happens. Now, it is not just me that has this post-traumatic stress disorder over that word. This is Kent again. He described stories in this book, Extreme Programming Explained. There's a first and a second edition. Has anybody read, has anybody been in this long enough to have read the first edition of XP Explained? Wow, okay, you guys are the serious old timers. <laughs> so you know that, that you know that there's have you read both? Uh, it's it's kind of like an old and new testament, uh, because in the New Testament the second edition is a kinder, gentler methodology. And there's kind of hell of hellfire and brimstone in the first edition. But uh, look uh, the in the second edition and both editions he introduces this concept of stories pretty much the same way. By the way, you'll notice that he does not call them user stories. Now, this edition came out in 2003, the same year as Mike Cohn's user stories applied, the same year as Kent Beck wrote the forward in Mike Cohn's book, but Kent continues to insist on calling them stories because he's referring to the way that they're used, not the way that they're written. And, um, and look, we can use that story concept if we're talking about APIs and headless stuff in the back of the system because it's referring to the way we work, not the fact that it has to be about users and user interface. Now look, Kent said that software development has been steered wrong by the word requirement, defined in the dictionary as something mandatory or obligatory. The word carries a connotation of absolutism and permanence, inhibitors to embracing change. The word requirement is just plain wrong. Now uh, that's, you can see that's the that's what I highlighted in the book. Look, um, it, what I asked Kent, where did this whole concept come from? You know, even in your books, Kent, you start talking about story cards pretty early on, and you, you get people kind of fixated on writing stories. And uh, you know, again, a back and forth email conversation I had <coughs> a long time ago. Now he said, "Look, what I was thinking of is the way users sometimes tell stories about the cool new things their product does." Uh, like I type in a zip code and it automatically fills in the city and state without me having to touch a button. I think that was the example that triggered the idea. If you can tell stories about what the software does and generate energy and interest and vision in your listener's mind, then why not tell the story before the software does it? it it's a simple idea. We, we talk about uh, what, how, who's doing it and what they're doing and uh, we well, generate that energy, interest, and vision in listeners' mind and well, it's that, it's that shared understanding that we are fishing for. Um, when we have these discussions, we need to focus those discussions and collaboration uh, around who will use the product and what they'll do after delivery. Well, this is the who, what, and why. Basically, you need to think things through. I've got another cake wreck uh, picture to show. This is a, you have to brace yourselves. This is a cake for a baby shower. So look, that is a cake, honestly. Now, do they have, they, I know that they have, people have told me they have baby showers in Germany. Um, some countries don't, but yeah, yeah this is the party if, if you're uh, a woman who's pregnant and uh, you hold the party, it's a celebration, you get lots of presidents, presents for, uh, usually for your, you know, for your, uh, your baby and uh, look if you look at that as a cake it is a work of art I cannot create a cake that uh, isn't the shape of the pan it came out of or I can't frost it in any color other than what's in the pan um, yeah, this is perfectly sculpted it really looks like a lifelike baby but uh, look you have to but, well, when we talk about the who what and why and look, what I will focus people on is not what it looks like, uh, but w what will people do? Look, if you think of a cake, what do people do with cakes? I think it's pieces. Yeah, uh, it's, 
it's when you take that thing to a baby shower <laughs> that it is a real groove killer. If you just focus on how it looks, it is awesome. But if you focus on how it's used and what people will do with it and uh, what effect you want to have people have. If your goal is a happy baby shower, this is kind of a groove killer. Um, look, if we talk about all this stuff, uh, let me get this last point here. There is always too much to build. We've got to be constantly focusing our conversations on building things that matter. We need to minimize output. We need to uh, understand this who, uh, this what, and, and this why. That's why we're doing this. I don't care how you write stories, what template you use, but if you're not talking with each other, they're not stories. They're just crappy documentation. If you don't talk about what you can take out and how you can make the, the value as high as possible, then they're not stories. They're just, uh, well, just communicating requirements. I want to trim just a little bit here and make sure that I'm getting to stuff that really matters. solve these two problems when used right, but stories create another problem. This one I'll show. We focus a lot on stories and we focus a lot on development. And uh, if we're focused on development, well one of the things we'll look at a lot is that stupid velocity thing. And velocity is how much stuff we build. And if we're using a process like Scrum, we've got these short sprints, and we grab things out of a product backlog, and we want to put them through, and we expect several of these stories to go through in a sprint. And for several of them to go through in a sprint, they need to be small. Small enough that we can finish a few, and usually people will say, look, a good story has got to be you got to be able to build this in maybe one to three days, for, at least for the development time of it. And look, to know if it was small, we needed to be able to estimate it. And we really need to get things done, really done, which means we need to be able to test it, and we need to be able to demonstrate it. Um, and, uh, well, uh, there's a lot of things a good story needs to be. And, and in fact, a lot of people will say it's not a good story doesn't have all those things and in fact if we're going to really get it done it probably needs to have that acceptance criteria so we can agree on you know, whether it is or isn't done I want to find this picture I want to ask look when you come up with great ideas that will help people solve a problem and when you deliver them to them uh, things will be better do they fit that criteria you're supposed to say no <laughs> uh, the, the problem is, we come up with great ideas and they are big, blobby things. They're big, they may be for whole features or whole capabilities or maybe even for whole products. Uh, and I need to tell you that, uh, well, these ideas are still stories. These, this does not mean they're good stories, these are still fabulous stories because the way we use stories, well, um, Stories are meant to be used this way. They're a way to work, not a way to document. And um, but we can still pick up this story and we can talk about what it is and who it's for and why we're building it. In fact, when we pull one of these stories out to first talk about and have these best first conversations, the conversation isn't about how big is it, what's the acceptance criteria, and uh, the, how do we test it. The conversation is, well, should we build this? Uh, do we make a go decision or do we make a no-go decision and say, this is a stupid story, we should throw it away? Um, look, uh, when we make the no-go decision from here, it goes into this super special backlog. <laughs> this is called the output minimizer. This is one of your most valuable backlogs, especially when your goal is to minimize output. 
Um, but if we make a go decision, we say, okay, great, we've got to break this thing down into a, a lot of little pieces uh, because uh, we, we need to better understand it. We need to tell a lot more stories. But our first best conversation is about that. Now, I'm going to tell you this story. Um, this is in the story mapping book, too. This, is, this lady's name is Rachel Davies. In the ni late 1990s, she worked at this company in the UK called Connextra. Connextra is one of the early adopters of all this uh, story stuff and this XP stuff. And, uh, well, uh, they had this kind of open backlog policy where if you thought of a great idea, you could put it into the backlog. And they were trying to stay true to this stuff, so they kept them on cards and people would write uh, a few words on a card. And, well, because it was open, everybody did exactly that. And the backlog, you remember that too many ideas thing? It would just pile up and pile up. And it was Rachel's job to kind of start to go through these and figure out what they were about and who they were for. And she would pick it up and there would be a few words on there. She couldn't, she had to, to figure out who wrote it, she'd have to try and recognize the handwriting. She couldn't recognize it, she'd have to ask around. And then uh, the, the few words on there would usually be for a feature or something like that. And then Rachel would, Rachel would find the person who wrote it and she would say, well, tell me a little bit about this. Who is it for? And uh, how would they use it and what benefit do they get? And she would have this short conversation with people and people would say, uh, they try and think it through and they say, oh, you know what, now that I think about it, they can already do that in this other place in the product, never mind. Or, oh, now that I think about it, you know, a better solution would be this other thing. Or, ah, oh, now that I think about it, never mind, I don't think that's a good idea anymore. And Rachel got tired of this, and she said, look, I just would like people to think it through just a little bit more before they drop it in the backlog. So <laughs> well, they and people at Connextra came up with this clever template. And this card she's holding in front of her is the template. They, they put this as a card to pass around at a conference in 2001. This is the last known one of these cards in existence. So it is a, it's a historical artifact. It's, uh, this is where they announced this their clever idea to make story writing go better. First, I need to point out it has a title. When I see people using these story templates sometimes, they forget the title. Um, it's like having the abstract of a book but no title. Uh, and it's this format that we all know and love. If you know stories, it says as a type of user, I want something so that uh, I get some sort of benefit. And this was a super important conversation starter uh, because it, actually, the person who wrote it would have to think it through enough to be able to write that. And then when Rachel showed up, she could read it and think it through, and then they could sit down. And the conversation started from there. It didn't finish the conversation. In fact, there was all that talking to do. Uh, look, if Rachel was going to move this thing from a big idea to lots of little ideas, uh, they were going to have to break it down and figure it out. If you've tried to use that format when stories are a little tiny like this, you might have felt it feeling really bumpy and not quite right. Uh, and what's interesting is it really wasn't ever intended for that, for those little things, although we use it for those little things a lot. We keep trying to force fit it down there. Rachel used that originally to drive her first best conversations. Now, look, uh, if for these first conversations, yeah, that story template works pretty well. In my story mapping book, uh, there's something that I like that's a little bit more fuller feature called an opportunity canvas. It goes deeper into who, what, and why, and how we measure success. If it's successful, it helps us make a little bit better no, go, no, go template. Don't expect people to write that before they put it in. We work on it together to have that conversation. But this middle area here, well, I'm going to talk about this stuff as, well, it's, this is discovery work. In discovery work, it isn't about building software fast. Well, discovery is about, well, it's about learning fast. This isn't going to be a talk about discovery, although we could go into a lot of detail about that. But look, um, discovery is where we uh, build a deeper understanding of this product. If I've got a... If I've got a big idea, I uh, can pull that big idea. Uh, if it passes that go test, I pull it in and move it forward from here. So let's fast forward and talk about uh, 
When I talk about story mapping, this is the picture I show most often. There are a lot of really great pictures of story maps, but they were shot and I wasn't there when they were created. But I was there when this one was created. This guy's name is Gary. Gary, uh, when I met him, uh, he was a founder of a, he was trying to get a startup off the ground. He's a musician and he had this idea for a product that would allow musicians to collaborate and promote their work and uh, manage their bands and uh, a bunch of stuff. He called it uh, Mimi for short, which is short for Music Industry Marketing Interface. He described his big idea to a friend of mine who's a, who ran a small development company. Uh, the friend of mine's a pretty notable guy, he's written books on Ruby on Rails and things like that, and the guy's a super sharp guy, and my friend says, this sounds great, Gary, Good. we're going to use this Agile process, uh, write down all the stuff you want and put it in a backlog, and uh, then we'll and then prioritize that, we will start working on the stuff that you think is most important, the highest value stuff first. So Gary did that, they got to work, and they were working in really short cycles, at the end of week one, uh, Gary saw some stuff working. And Gary said, wow, this is great. I've been imagining this for so long. It's great to see something working. A couple more weeks go by. Gary sees more stuff working. And Gary's saying, wow, this is still it's pretty great. But software takes a long time, doesn't it? And my friend says, oh, yeah, but you know, we're just laying down a lot of the foundational stuff. Once we get all that done, it's going to start going really fast. A couple more weeks go by. Gary sees more software working. And Gary's saying, wow, this is taking a lot longer than I thought. And he asked the question that, no developer wants to answer. He asks, when are we going to be done? And uh, uh, my friend tries to explain story points and velocity and uh, some other <coughs> stupid stuff that real humans don't understand. And, um, and uh, the end of the conversation, uh, well, my friend's telling Gary it's going to be a long time, a combination of somewhere between a long time and we don't know. And, uh, and Gary said, can we do something else other than Agile because this isn't working very well. And that's when my friend called me and said, can you go help out Gary, talk some sense into him. I showed up to talk with Gary. My first conversation with Gary wasn't to explain Agile, wasn't to explain good stories or explain the story template. My first conversation was to talk to Gary about his big product idea. I'm going to call that framing. It's his first best conversation. It's the backup and have Gary tell me the big story of his product. What is it? Who is it for? Why are you building it? What does success look like for you? The next conversation actually is just talking about the people, the characters in our big story. We'll talk about who the users are and, and, and as he's talking, I'm writing things down. I'm externalizing his ideas. And uh, we get those ideas written down and as soon as they're on cards, we can move them around and organize them. But, you know, if an idea is more important than another one, you don't have to give people special instructions for them to realize if I put it on top, that means it's more important. They figure that out on their own. Um, and we rip up things. Our next conversation, I say, okay, great, great, I've got the big idea, we know who the players are. Pretend for a minute your software is completely done and you ship it and it's going live tomorrow. Let's talk about a day in the life of these people using your product. Let's start from the beginning. Everybody knows the first steps are usually uh, they sign up and log in. Uh, uh, but then after that, it gets a little bit more hazy. But he talks and he says, well, okay, well, first they would do this, and then this, and then this. And as he's talking, I'm writing. And I'm writing down these short verb phrases, these steps. And we kind of get a flow left to right. And this is the first time Gary's actually told the story of his product. He's described features a lot. He said it looks like this. Uh, a lot. He's described his baby, uh, look at that baby cake a lot, uh, but he hasn't talked it through quite right. Uh, we find places where he hasn't thought it all the way through, where we have to say, oh gosh, I don't know what would happen there, and we talk about it, and we make some guesses about what steps would look like. When he gets to a place where he has given a lot of thought, lots of details spill out, and so the depth of this thing kind of holds, well, smaller steps, uh, details, other things like that. What uh, this is all a story map is. It starts with a big story, and st story mapping is a way I get from a big story to lots of small stories. Simple structure, left to right flow with steps, top to bottom, uh, breaking those things down. At the end of this conversation with Gary, this is it's about a four hour conversation, we're not done. We haven't talked through all the users. Where there's thin parts in the map, it 
sometimes on a mature map, when, when we've been working on for a while, when it's thin, it means that's a super simple step. In this conversation, thin means I haven't thought about it much at all. And uh, there were parts where he'd given a lot of thoughts. It was super uneven uh, how much thinking he had given this stuff. And uh, Gary said, wow, this is great. I'm really, uh, I've had this idea and this vision for a while, but it's, I haven't had any way to think about it thoroughly. And this has really helped. And I know where to start thinking and filling in here. Uh, but we have a lot more to go. Jeff, how long do you think all this stuff is going to take to build? And I said, well, at the rate your team is going right now, this is about six to nine months worth of work. And when we talk about the rest, you know, it could easily be double that. And Gary turned white and uh, uh, said, I don't have that much money to build this. And I, and I said, ah, oh, this is terrible. And how much, uh, you've been building for a couple of months, how much have you built so far? And Gary said, I haven't built any of this so far. Uh, in fact, the stuff I built was the stuff I kind of thought I had to build first. And now that I see this, I wouldn't have built any of what I built before. So this was a bad story for Gary. Now, the, the, if I fast forward, the happy ending is he did launch a product. The product is out there. Uh, Gary scaled up to between 50, 60 employees. As he runs the company with his brother. His brother moved to Hawaii to run the part of the company. He moved to Israel, and they have a couple offices. And at the tail end of 2014, they were bought by a company called GoDaddy. Do people know? they are. So Mad Mimi is a product that's out there that does the direct email marketing stuff. It kind of has a cool look and feel uh, because it was built by a musician. Um, and uh, the, the company uh, sends out millions of email messages a month, uh, which everybody hates. Uh, but the, the, he's done pretty well with it. Now for him, getting his vision straight uh, was, uh, was the first step and the map helped. The backlog did not. Uh, I'm going to show just a couple more examples of backlogs and some uh, interesting backlog tricks and we'll go from there. Look, this is a backlog being built by a company called Globo.com. Globo is a, a large media company and they're the largest media company in Brazil. They own, the tele they own television stations, radio stations, um, they make a lot of made for TV movies and uh, things like that. They are building a backlog, or they're thinking through a product called Baixa Tudo. It's Portuguese for download it all. It's a, they're building a set, another release for an existing product that they need to substantially improve. The building the product starts by building that long line of green cards. It's just telling the story. And they're kind of good at controlling their flow. They don't get stuck in rat holes and go down deep at first. They get that long line of green cards, and then it's really long, so they add another card on top to sort of roll it up a little bit to distill it makes it a little bit easier to read you don't start top down you kind of start middle out that's that's what I've learned from doing this stuff and then as they keep they're watching their, they're looking at their existing product they're seeing what it does and they're saying okay it would be better if we did this and as they, they keep they get the main line out and then they start saying well what about and it would be better if and they keep adding more body to this thing now there's some bright green cards in the middle and everybody always asks me, well, what are those bright green cards in the middle? And there's, there's no difference, they just ran out of the other cards. But if you watch, you know, as they're pouring in details, there's a lot more of those bright green cards now than there was a minute ago, or this is kind of time lapse. It's because the longer they tell the story, they rip up cards, they replace cards, and the story keeps getting bigger. After a while, it starts to stabilize. We, uh, and one of the things I've also learned the hard way is you need to move pretty quickly to start to visualize it. Uh, now, usually I'll see people kind of build simple sketches of what a UI might look like, exactly the way those people at Atlassian were doing. They are people that tend to start with a sketchy thing and arrange it in a flow, and then they start writing bullet points underneath it uh, to get something that's kind of mappy-like. These guys started with a map partly because I've worked with them before, and then they move from there to uh, visualizing the UI. This is, it's a developer and a UI person working together to extract stuff from the database so that they can be building this simple paper prototype using real digital assets. Uh, it's, I didn't know they made the video. I found that picture of myself there. Uh, the, by the time I got there, the week after they made the video, the map is getting bigger and bigger. There are already lots of these They've run out of white cards, and now they've got yellow cards in there. And they are 
hitting what every single person hits. They're hitting the too much to build problem. See there. Um, those are the punch points. Um, I've got a couple more things I want to go through. Is your energy holding up okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's lots of examples, but let me hit, uh, well, a couple more. This is another uh, backlog at Globo. It is a big project. When I was, uh, when I showed up to work with them uh, on this visit, they said, that Monday morning they said, got to go work with this team. Uh, they're kind of in a crisis. They got a lot to build. They don't have much time. I showed up. And it wasn't one team, it was four teams in a room. They're working on a major kind of overhaul of their underlying content management system. Uh, the, the ownership, the leadership of Globo is, uh, they're feeling like a third world country because their websites do not look as good as, their news website does not look as good as CNN.com and their sports website doesn't look as good as ESPN and their, Entertainment websites don't look as good as you know American entertainment sites, uh, and the, they've got to change the content management system. Uh, they've got a charter to do that. They've got multiple teams that work together on it. When I showed up, they all had their separate backlogs, uh, and but they were they didn't know how to kind of sync them up or get them going. I said, look, it's one product. You've got to map it as one product. So get your backlogs on the wall. They knew how to do this. By the end of the day, they were there. In the process of building a map, you know, when you map, you're kind of forced to think it through from a user's perspective. You find holes, and they found holes. They found overlap, places where one team was building something and the other team was building the same thing, and they debugged that. And they found places where they definitely needed to work together on things. Uh, things were terrific. Uh, on Wednesday afternoon, somebody told me, you really need to work with that team, they're in crisis. I said, no, no, I already worked with them on Monday, they're okay. They said, no, 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 they're in crisis, go check. I showed up, they were in crisis again. I said, gosh, you guys seem so, everything seems so good on Monday, what went wrong? And they said, well, we started to look at the details and the dependencies and we started doing estimation, and this is gonna take a really long time. And I said, how long is this gonna take? They said, 12 to 14 months. Does anybody here know anybody from Brazil? You ever met a Brazilian before? Uh, uh, look, I've been to Brazil. A 9 o'clock meeting in Brazil usually starts around 10. Lunch in Brazil usually lasts two, two and a half hours. Uh, and uh, it's, well, when a Brazilian developer tells you 12 to 14 months, that usually means somewhere between two years and never. And it's not going to get done. And I said, I thought you guys had an urgent deadline. And I said, yeah, we're supposed to go live for Brazilian elections in four months. How are we going to get all this done? I said, well, you're not, uh, for one. That's not going to happen. But look, let's talk about what a successful outcome looks like for Brazilian elections. First off, you're going to have to focus on specific users and people. It's Brazilian elections. So look, what parts of, uh, uh, you know, what do you want to, uh, what, if you're looking at elections, they're not going to soap opera websites to see election results. Uh, so we, it sounds like you need to focus on the news website and said, oh yeah, we need to focus on the news website, maybe some other political sites. And you're trying to renovate or get more interactive content. And they said, yeah, we have this problem where when people show up uh, to look at the news website, it has yesterday's stories on it. And it's hard for the people who edit content to, get the content edited online in real time, so there's those problems, plus we need interactive graphs and things like that. And we have a long talk about what would be a fabulous release for Brazilian elections, but we'll narrow the focus to focusing on those news websites and the type of things that users want to see there. They say, okay, we got this, and we grab these, uh, these rolls of blue painter's tape. Um, what color is painter's tape here? And say it again. Kemp bund. Kemp bund. Yeah, what color is? Oh, yellow. 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 Okay. Yellow. Okay. Yellow. Okay. Yellow. Okay. Yellow. 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 Yellow.
look, let's see if I can annotate this. That thing there is a minimum viable product. It is a first release. But what makes it minimum viable isn't because it is the least we could possibly build. What makes it minimum and viable, viable means successful. It means the least we could build to be successful in our current market. And uh, the, as long as we narrow our focus to the news website and news people and stuff we need during elections, it's agreeing on that target market outcome, agreeing on what success looks like that allows us to find minimum and viable. When people argue about it, it's usually because they haven't agreed on the, that little thing that uh, there's a few words written on there that uh, summarizes a long conversation they have. And once they get the hang of this, they realize, oh, we're not supposed to prioritize these stories. What we're supposed to do is prioritize these outcomes. We have to think about what users and customers. And hey, the next big thing on the horizon is reality TV shows and the recruiting process for that. And uh, if we support people doing that, that's going to change things. And they start thinking of a roadmap in terms of not what features when, but who when, what markets when, or what groups of people when. That's what drives priority. These mapping structures, they are oversimplified. You can't see branches, you can't see uh, uh, overlapping workflows. Uh, it, it's, uh, but they are, the simple two-dimensional structure allows you to prioritize pretty quickly and make sense of things, look at things holistically. Now, look, I just told you, um, yeah, let's do this. Uh, well, I'll, I'll refer to this as a release strategy, um, but the strategy, this is our guess, this is a hypothesis, this is what we believe is true, and how do we know that, that those choices they made are right? How do you know that they're going to work? And uh, well, In fact, you don't. I'm going to show, this is a quick visualization from a guy named Henrik Niebuhr. Uh, Henrik uh, is a guy that's done these Spotify development culture videos and uh, they're pretty cool. Look, if you have an idea for a product, I believe if I build this, everyone will think it is awesome and uh, I will make lots of money. Uh, but if I were to start to build this in a piece at a time and I were to try and show it to people to see if they really like it, if I build a first piece, and people look at it, they say, well, I, I don't know, that doesn't look like a transportation device. To me, I, I can't imagine uh, how I would go anywhere in that, and uh, my feedback is that sucks. And if we add more to it, it still sucks, and it still sucks, and it doesn't not suck as a solution until I can start to use it as a transportation device. So look, Henrik's uh, basic idea is this, uh, Let's start by delivering something to someone that does sort of suck, but at least it's a transportation device. Now, that's a crap transportation device, and I'm pretty sure that it's not going to be viable. Viable meaning successful. But it, I don't mean it's a crappy skateboard. I mean, it's a fantastic skateboard, but a skateboard is clearly not what's needed if I'm trying to commute to work. Uh, now I, but at least I can get some feedback on it and people say, well, it's not fast enough to commute to work and I fall down a lot. And, and we can say, well, in release two, we fixed the falling down problem with this handle thing, this scooter thing. And I say, well, it's still not fast and I avoid a little more injury. Uh, in release three, we've got some uh, pedals on this thing and this is better and now this is starting to get good. Uh, that's great. If you live in the Netherlands, that is, you can stop right there. That's all you need. Um, if, uh, if you've got a little bit farther to commute, uh, things like that, uh, that, adding that engine to that makes that a lot funner. Um, and look, uh, adding a body and an extra and two more wheels and, and things like that, uh, yeah, that still makes it fun. But the truth is that minimum and viable might have been somewhere in there and it really depends on who your customers are and who your market is maybe i could have stopped uh, there but if i just shoot right for the uh, if my hypothesis is big and i just build that one big one uh, we never learn let's make this real here this guy's name is eric uh eric is uh this is Eric's backlog on the left-hand side here. Now, he's got this sliced up into releases. 
Now the reason the top of it is empty is he's been pulling sticky notes off and moving them onto this task board to the right and his team has been breaking them down and building them. So he's working his way through this release. Now it would have looked like that when it was full, something like that. And, but the thing is, Eric has already released this product uh, and he's building a, a, this for a next release and a next release and a next release and below that are a bunch of other ideas uh, for this thing. Now, what I'm telling you is he's releasing this product knowing full well that the people who get the product will probably not like it. He knows full well that this product will not be uh, successful in the market, that it's not viable. Let me ask you a quick question. If you were going to release a product to someone who you know won't think it's successful or won't like it, who would you release it to? Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. To friends, because yeah, they'll understand you. But um, um, has anybody ever seen a, a kind of a drawing that looks like this before? Mm -hmm. This is called the crossing the chasm curve, and it looks like when we look at the adoption of a product, we'll look at the the, the number of users over time. And uh, the big majority is over here, and uh, we've got the uh, early and the late majority. These people over here are the laggards. And for people who haven't seen this thing before, I'm sure you have heard the term um, early adopters. It's the early adopters are here, and uh, these people are called the innovators. Innovators are the people that will use a product well, even before it's a product. They'll uh, assemble their own. They're, I know people that have uh, bought a kit to build a 3D printer online and then say, are you one? Uh, that's called an innovator. Innovators don't need a product. They will uh, solder it together themselves to get a product. Uh, but early adopters um, might need it to be a product. But if you ask a customer if they'll try something, they'll say, well, I don't know who else is using this. They are not an early adopter. Uh, early adopters don't really care who else is using it so much. If they think it's a cool solution or if it's interesting, they'll adopt it. That's why a lot of products fall into this gap because early adopters will pick it up, but they never quite get the product over the hump. Now, if we're trying to build a product that's going to all these people, well, it's this core group of people uh, that we want to get it to. And the term used by the product people I work with uh, term we're kind of socializing here is a CDP, which is sort for customer development partners. These are people that you know that, well, they're your friends, but they're also your customers. They're the customers you've made friends with. And these are the people that kind of fit this profile. They'll, they'll give you feedback early. And uh, Eric, uh, this guy that's there, He's releasing lots of small releases into a small pool of people. He'll iterate with them until he is confident that they love the product. Confident until they think it's awesome. Uh, confident until their confidence off awesome and he is. Um, there's an old expression that there's never a second chance for a first impression. So look, if you show it to if you show a product that is not ready to this majority. They're not going to try it again, or it's going to be expensive for you to get them to try it again. And the term we use for this strategy is um, nail it before you scale it. All right, one more story mapping trick, and then we'll uh, shut this down. This is I wanted to finish in an hour. This has already been an hour, an hour and fifteen minutes. Let's do this. Look, uh, suppose uh, uh, suppose finishing on time was sort of important to you. Um, if you need to finish on time, look, one of the things I'll focus on is leveraging iterative and incremental thinking. Now, I think some people may have seen this. This is an old visualization that I uh, socialized a long time ago. But the idea is that most Agile people fall into this trap of thinking only incrementally. Uh, look, imagine uh, you are Leonardo da Vinci, and you have this, uh, you need to paint a painting for a client, and you've only got five days to do it, and an Agile person rushes up to you and says, look, Leonardo, all you gotta do is build a backlog. 
You will break your painting up into painting parts, and every day you will paint a painting part, and you will see your painting come alive, and look on day one, you will paint part, and on day two, you will paint more parts, and on day three, more parts, and day four, and on day five, uh, you will, your painting will be done, and you'll be able to see progress every step of the way, and you could ship any day if you kind of had to, and this strategy works so long as you've got clear vision and you have accurate estimates. Now, does anybody believe that Leonardo da Vinci paints that way? <laughs> um, look, uh, the way artists actually work is they start by acknowledging that uh, we, we may not be exactly clear on how this is going to end up. And if I'm not exactly clear on ex how this is going to end up, even if I'm going to start w with a bit of a sketch or an underpainting, something that lets, lets me see what the, the composition looks like. And uh, I might decide that, oh my gosh, I think the smile is going to be an important part of this picture. And those mountains in the background are distracting. So I will uh, iterate. I will change it. What this means, uh, well, all right. In the, if this was software, in the software world, uh, this is called bad requirements or scope creep. In the real world, this is just called learning. And that's okay. And what it means is if you're managing a backlog of stories, it means you write stories that make changes to what you did before. But if you're watching the clock, you focus your, you say, okay, we got to jump up on a fidelity level here, and we've got to start adding color and form and uh, more stuff to it, and we keep making changes as we go. I know that matures pretty quickly, but, um, uh, but Da Vinci works fast. Uh, <laughs> this is iterative and incremental. When we say iterative, when we're talking about a process, it means repeat the same process over and over. But when we say iterative and it's a product, we mean we mean the same thing as rework. It's uh, well, and that's a that's a problem. That's one one thing that people don't get used to. That's why people will go through for that incremental strategy. Now let's. Let me put this in a map. Now, I've been showing lots of super big maps, but they're really usually not that big. This is a map for one feature. These two guys have been working on it. They've, so one mistake that people follow is they feel like they've got to map the whole product. Don't. If you're adding one feature, map the one feature you're adding to your product. That feature starts with one user that does one, two, three steps, and another user that does one more step that's kind of an approval step, or uh, I acknowledge that step. And uh, they've already done some UI prototype stuff and tested that stuff. You can see the, the, they printed out and put it behind. I know that is a story about that pop-up because I can see it right behind there. And they've broken this thing up into slices. But those slices aren't releases. Those slices are their development strategy, what they want to build first and next and next. Is that first slice that's going to give us a sketch or what sometimes gets called a walking skeleton or a steel thread. It's just enough to see it work end to end. As a matter of fact, to see it work end to end, there's a first step the user is supposed to do here and they decided to skip it or fake it or write some code to stub it in and then they'll actually do the step in the second slice. But that well, with every pad of sticky notes, you get these two shapes. You get that square and you get that diamond. And when they twist it into a diamond, it means this is a story about something technical we're going to do. And yeah, what it really means is we're going to build it and rip it out later. And then they're slowly building this thing up. It's doing things this way that maximizes how much they can learn. That very first slice is working end to end. Uh, they can see it running. They can start to make sure all the database tables are built. Um, they can start to look at performance and scalability early. This kind of strategy has you building things more like an artist. And what it means, and the reason this kind of strategy is a little bumpy, is uh, look, if you were uh, trying to demonstrate what you were doing and you're at a sprint review and you show the first version to stakeholders, stakeholders look at it and say, well, I don't like that very much at all. Um, and they might think you don't know much about uh, how to write software, how to do sculpture, but in fact, that's exactly how you do a sculpture, and it's exactly how you write software if you want to finish on time. Most people will opt for building a perfectly formed nose instead of building the whole form. All right, let's see if I can uh, put all this together. 
Yeah, that's it. Look, uh, I wanted to make the point that stories about are about a way we, we you need to change the way you work, not the way you write down information. Uh, that we're using simple visualizations to, to anchor our stories, to work like vacation photos. They help us build shared understanding. Look, we need to map the whole story to find the parts that matter most. Do, do we take big stories and map, uh, map them all? Look, if we think things through, we can pull out things that, we, that, that don't help, that don't minimize that out, that don't maximize outcome and in. Uh, we can remove the things that are not giving us the outcome and impact that we want. Well, what that guy Eric was doing was building minimum viable product tests. He needs to do that to find out what's minimum viable on the market. And uh, what those last guys were doing were building their product up iteratively and incrementally. The mapping thing is just another way to deal with stories, and for me, the mapping thing keeps the original promise of story, the, the, the ability to really have a conversation about what people are doing with your product. That was an hour and 17 minutes, and we started at 6.15. Uh, more than you needed. Uh, I can answer any questions you've got, but thanks for showing up. If you've got to get out of here, it's kind of awesome. Uh, I don't know what you showed up to hear or listen to, but does anybody have any does anybody have any questions? It's very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> we know everything. Yeah, I, I suspect that could be true. <laughs> um, there, I know you know from the show of hands for people that read the old uh, XP books, and there's some people that have been at this a little while. Uh, so I'll ask you a question. Does that, is, for the people who have been at this a while, does it change? How is it different than you thought of uh, for stories? Does it change the way you think about? Is that different than you thought stories were? Yeah, not an easy question to answer. All right. <laughs> I, I, have been, I have been quite some time at this, and uh, I feel that uh, actually the uh, story writing and the process matures, and partly not in a good way, because everyone wants to do some sort of agile, and what they typically still do, although there are a lot of consultants, they still just put their requirements in some sort of story. So this has not changed a lot since I started in with Agile in 2005-06. Yeah. I think this is still a problem for organizations, especially in, in Europe. I think. Yeah, I think I think yeah, again the original original promise of it was changing the way we work, and people are using the template and uh, acceptance criteria to displace older other kinds of um, ex the. The story template plus acceptance criteria, maybe plus a, a few other templates, end up replacing other styles of requirements people used to write. And then people complain about them being, you know, bad requirements again. Right. And the only thing that makes them good is the conversation. But that's the big point I think people have missed. But uh, and the bigger question is, what do you do about that? I don't think any, I don't think people actually like to talk to each other. So they oftentimes do not. <laughs> It's, it's the same as the guy uh, at, at Google had a hard time to introduce uh, a TDD because they said, we can do it already, we're very good at programming, yeah, we don't yeah. need to do tests. And this is what legacy product people who, think. Just out of curiosity, the guy you're talking about, who are you talking about? Uh, I forget his name all the time. Who did that testing on the toilet? Uh, oh, things? yes. Anyone knows okay. the name? Yeah, all right. The, I yeah, I've talked to a couple people there, but yeah, I remember that thing I read there. Is and he had a really hard time to introduce that yeah. because People, the, 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 the picture you have yourself and the picture others have of the quality of your work is yeah. obviously oftentimes yeah. different. Well, is there anything if, if other? Forget the stories and the story mapping. Uh, I can answer. I've been, I can answer questions on anything. <laughs> 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 Please.
So yeah, yeah. Jeff M. Ralph from State Farm. And you said something I really love, which is the heart of business decisions is not what to build, but who to pay attention to. That was excellent. I love it. <laughs> I, well, I'm sorry, I, have a, I don't have an original thought in my head, but let me tell, well, there is. So, a, so my question actually, my question on that is totally agree, but often, oftentimes you have business owners who should take business decisions considering this, and it's very hard to tell them. So how do you convince them? I tell them to read this Harvard Business Review article called The Big Lie of Strategic Planning. Um, because it's a Harvard Business Review article. Uh, oops. Thank you. Uh, because it's a Harvard Business Review article, uh, I'll uh, pay attention to it. Uh, and it's, it's fairly recent. It's a 2014 article. But it boils down or it distills strategy. If you've ever read an HBR article, they've got the, you know, the simple bullet. But it boils down strategy into two, two uh, kind of silly questions. It's where you'll play and uh, how you'll win. Now, when they say where you play, they, you know, they, this is shorthand for your, your target market, and market are the customers, customers and users, and the how you'll win is, well, how is this solution better than alternatives? Uh, uh, well, basically, how does it help? Um, and if you're competing commercially, how is it better? How is it better than competitors? How is it better than what they do today? Um, it, the paper does a pretty good job of making the point that, um, that uh, yeah, I, uh, I don't have any good ways of convincing them. Uh, it just you know, tell them, look, if your strategy is to focus on everybody, you know the product is gonna be a lot bigger, right? <laughs> uh, if, if your strategy, to, your decision strategy is not to decide, <laughs> um, that's not a good strategy. And the, the, the paper's pretty good at pointing out that um, uh, the planning by putting features into a roadmap doesn't work, uh, planning by budgeting for features, those kinds of things don't work. It's focusing on markets and focusing on market outcomes that, that does work. And if you've got a, they also, let me give you one other thing one of the things they talk about is when you say strategy, it means the same thing, uh, that, that strategy is always a risk, it is always a guess, and in the, they say guess, they say gamble, and I'm kind of building up to this, uh, they start saying bet. Now, bet as a word I'm starting to hear more and more. Uh, I was talking to a guy I know at Spotify, and I met him when Spotify was much smaller in uh, based in Stockholm and now he lives in Boston because Spotify just bought a company in Boston and he's helping that get going and over and over in this conversation just a just a month ago he kept saying the bets we're working on right now are and he kept using that word bet over and over uh, it helped people understand that yeah we can build these things but there's no guarantee they're going to work and or we're going to get what we expect but I think I've gone sideways from your question a little bit but uh, yeah, but the, these are the things that all, uh, when people can't prioritize or can't focus, it's usually you have to go up a couple levels in the stack to uh, the decisions about who our customers are and what our product vision is. And those are the things that we really struggle with. Any, any other questions? Yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, there, there and then there. <laughs> um, I often face the situation uh, that um, stones are too big to do it at one time. Um, do you have an approach on how to solve such situations? I could just, uh, I could probably, I may end up redrawing it when I just drew at the tail end of the class here. The, one of the points I'll make is these are stories all the way through. We start with big ideas and then we break them down into smaller ideas. And our job at this point isn't to say, okay, all that big idea broke into all those smaller ideas. Our job is to cut away 
um, and we might uh, call all these a first release, uh, and we might cut some more things and call those a second release, and we might uh, call those things uh, trash. Uh, that's what we do, and we may load those first things into a product backlog, but look, those are still too big, and that's okay. They're supposed to be. Um, what we end up doing, what I, um, what I talk about is this original mantra, and for people who have been around for a while, you've heard this card conversation, confirmation mantra. What this means, have people heard this before? That, uh, well, well uh, uh, what I'm gonna tell you is that you need to use what I call a story workshop because I started with this before Scrum, but what gets called a backlog uh, grooming or backlog refinement uh, session. If I bring a card into a room and I've got people, uh, in, uh, ideally people in front of a whiteboard, they're gonna talk about it. Um, talking about it, well, I bring that card in. Talking about really means build shared understanding. Like I mentioned earlier in this conversation, it really means uh, doing what those guys at Atlassian did. Show me what it looks like. Sketch what it looks like. Uh, write down some things. Let me ask questions. I want to make sure that I understand. Uh, draw some boxes and arrows and flow charts, whatever hurt, wh whatever works to make a, help us understand it. And then this last confirmation thing is where we ask the question, uh, what would we check to confirm this is done? Um, getting to the too big part of uh, the thing. What would we check to con confirm it's done? This question gets answered easiest when people get it or understand it, and this is where we start making this bulleted list of, well, I bring it up and I do this and I enter this, I expect to see that. Uh, this is where the people may be familiar with, you could use behavior-driven development and be given when then kinds of form, uh, but however you choose to write it, uh, I end up just looking for quick bullet points. All right, let me ask a question here. Who has been in a backlog grooming or backlog refinement session before? Okay, that's a lot. Now, if you think back to the last time you were in one of those, and if you think of stories you brought in to talk about, when you left the backlog grooming session, were stories, uh, were stories smaller than you thought when they came in? Were they about the same size as you thought when they came in? Or were they larger than you thought when you came in? How many had stories that were larger? How many had stories that are about the same size? How many had stories that were smaller? Smaller? Wow, oh, there's really smaller. Uh, so I usually say this, they're never smaller. They're almost <laughs> always larger. Uh, so one thing that we, that we successfully did, like you said, building the hypothesis and then building, uh, using it for the sub-stories. So actually asking each sub-story um, for its own contribution on the main hypothesis. Uh, that often helps to, to kill the whole story. Oh yeah, so that's one way to kill them. Yeah. So well, so I'm looking at size kind of here at the the tail end. I find that for yeah exactly. If you start here, and when you're talking about finding what's our big hypothesis and killing off things that aren't needed, that for me I'll use slicing that way or good conversations that way. But even when I load those things in the backlog, I've really committed. I'm going to be building those things. Um, when I come into this conversation, at least where I'm going uh, on the story's too big thing is, it's when we identify all these acceptance criteria, I find that I can kind of rope up with three or four acceptance criteria and say, okay, I can tackle those three in one story. We can take these other two, put separate those off into another story, those two, put it in another story, and those two, and put it in another story. My point is that the stories, they continuously break down. They may start big, um, but it's these good story conversations that help us make them small. When you're trying to make them small before you have the conversation, yeah, that, that's, that's a bit of skill. It takes time. So I think my short answer is, you know, who I want in this conversation is a product owner or a UX, someone who understands the product. I want somebody who is a developer and understands the developer. And I want somebody who is a tester. And I want to make clear, it is your people's job to understand this story, to get the acceptance criteria, and it is your job to break it down. 
and oftentimes uh, it's the acceptance criteria or having that will help us break it down. Also get the developers and others that will come up with, they know how to sometimes better break things down. So I'll hold them responsible for breaking it down. That may be controversial to some folks. I run into a lot of people that say it's the product owner's job to break them down first. Uh, but of course I want developers and others involved upstream here too. So uh, the, there's a lot of people there. But let, let them stay big as long as you can actually, but uh, you don't want them big when you get them down, when you get them down here. Yeah, it's, it's the backlog grooming where I pull them out of the backlog and load them in here, uh, and have those uh, conversations. And that's where they come out a lot smaller from that thing. It's these that end up going back in there. Um, does that answer the question? Over answer it? Maybe. Yeah, um, yeah, do you still have another question? Yeah. Um, <coughs> a lot of things that you mention are similar to the thinking and the startup methodology. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that accidentally or is that on purpose? Am I thinking uh, it's on purpose? Uh, so I do an awful lot of focus on what's going on in this product discovery area, and we talk an awful lot about it. Uh, that's one thing maybe I could have or should have talked about tonight, but you kind of have to know the agile stuff. To, one of the thing we'll, things we'll talk a lot about, if you were to look, there's a wall there that has all these hand drawings like this from a class that we just went through, and on the tail right-hand edge there, we'll, I'll talk, there's a couple different uh, quick and dirty models that describe how we open. I'll use Scrum mostly for uh, delivery work. And when you start using lean startup thinking and validated learning, it can happen a lot faster than a sprint. You can come up with ideas and validate them in hours or days, not weeks. So it runs in a different cycle. So you'll see some references there for uh, parallel track or dual track development. You'll see a model that talks, that flows from hypothesis uh, to, uh, through to test, through to building. So, no, not accidental. And one note for um, not everything is a requirement. In normal business uh, thinking, you're absolutely right. But there are circumstances, for example, when there are laws yes. that you really have to implement, and our company is doing that, and it's really hard to strip things down when you have to implement laws. Legal compliance. Legal compliance. Legal compliance. Legal compliance. Legal compliance. Yeah. yeah but Still, if you are a law and you have to implement it, it's really, really often not so easy to decide what not to do because it's, uh, yeah. The, you don't really decide not to You're absolutely something. right. Yeah. The, there's an old, uh, uh, by the way, I meant to add on to this, it's a uh, story template or opportunity canvas here. Story maps kind of fit here. This is their sweet spot. And then over here, when stories are small, this is where those uh, story conversations uh, or uh, workshops come in. I'm telling you that because I can't let go of the drawing until it's right. Um, the, yeah, you're right, you're absolutely right. Uh, I remember, gosh, I don't think I can re reduplicate it. There is a, an old book out there called How Designers Think, and he kind of drew a pyramid of uh, sort of a hierarchy of, um, of requirements or constraints. Uh, and on the bottom were regulatory. Uh, because uh, basically this is uh, how malleable uh, they are. Can I change them? Uh, things like that. Regulatory, the least malleable. Um, and then above that were uh, user. Um, things you're, look, unless you change who your users are, you can't make them smarter. You can't give them more domain knowledge and things like that. You can't change them. Um, and then, oh gosh, I forget the other things, but there were choices we made about the... Um, uh, the, the tools we used, uh, you know, what platform or things like that uh, that we used, and then uh, above that was, uh, well, our individual kind of design choices or how it looked and things like that, the, uh, the look and the, uh, you know, the detail design. Uh, this is the easiest to change, and it, look, if you're an architect, you may not think uh, changing the underlying platform is easy, but try and change, uh, take, you know, evaluate uh, changing the platform versus educating or changing your users or making them like a product they don't, uh, and then regulatory is at the bottom. You're right. Uh, those are the hard ones to change. Um, 
but I've been in enough, work with enough, one big, uh, I don't know much about Dodd-Frank laws. Does anybody have to work in finance where they had to, uh, it's a bunch of laws that were put in place around financial reporting in the U.S. I, I'm working with finance organizations there. Everybody had on their book <coughs> to be compliant with Dodd-Frank. And um, the, I saw lots of different ways to interpret those regulatory requirements. Some ways were uh, uh, kind of expensive, and other ways uh, uh, were super expensive. Um, and I saw <laughs> people's different interpretations of how this regulatory requirement needed to be put in our software very different. So even, yes, the regulatory requirement is uh, not changed, but how people interpret it, uh, some people can turn something simple into something super complicated. Another, uh, I don't answer short questions, I'm sorry, but I'll get the back first and then uh, forward. Uh, yeah. Hello. Um, I really like this concept of showing stuff, so getting together in the room, making this, this meeting and describing the stuff. But actually with my team, we cannot afford this luxury because we're spread around in several countries. So the only thing we have is calls, and very often, I explain some stuff, I get totally misunderstood on the other side, I take screenshots, and even then, it's not always enough. And um, I'm wondering, how can I make it better? Um, if we're, you know, if you're trying to get that shared understanding quality, if you're co-located, uh, you're in the same space, it's pretty easy. You've got, uh, you've got, um, You've got whiteboards and you've got sticky notes. Yeah, if you're not co-located, if you're distributed, um, you need to be able to show and tell and tell stories. I look for tools that allow multiple people to give input. Um, what I mean by that is not showing slides or other things. Uh, using things uh, like uh, variations of Google Docs and putting there things that allow people to draw in Google Docs. Um, there's a tool called uh, Murally that allows people to put things on walls and uh, things like that. There's a tool that I use for sticky notes called uh, Cardboard. It's at cardboardit.com. Uh, uh, somebody told me uh, recently about something called the uh, storm board uh, that they said they rely on. And I'm finding more and more tools that allow people to um, move things around, things like that. Uh, and one of the things, uh, look, um, it, one thing will do, I've seen people do other kind of facilitation tricks where you explain it and then you ask everybody else to write down for you what they heard and send it back to you and you'll integrate it back. Or uh, uh, one of the other things is, uh, that I'll do is, I will, if I'm writing, I will not write the acceptance criteria or I won't let product people write the acceptance criteria. They need to listen and they need to write them. And what they write uh, is sometimes a shock. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, and let them know, look, we run a risk of you guys not understanding each other. I'm not trying to cause more work for you. If you understand this, then this should be super fast. Uh, you just, you write it down. Uh, that helps a little bit. And the only other thing are things like this camera that I'm using right here. This is a document camera. And I see there's, uh, there's a company called, uh, mine is made by a company called uh, Elmo. Uh, not like the Sesame Street character, but uh, there is uh, a company called IPVO that, that uh, IPVO, and I see those on Amazon and you can buy them. And I see people putting these things in conference rooms because I can, put these down on a tabletop, or I can uh, point them out there at uh, you guys, and point them at a whiteboard, and move them around, and, and things. And there, uh, I see people putting these in conference rooms when they're doing conference calls. And yeah, I see a lot of, uh, 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 hip chat and Slack and other things like that, and uh, a lot of photographs of what happened on the whiteboard. But it's hard no matter what you do. Uh, does any of that, uh, tell, I think you've tried a lot of stuff, the way you're explaining things. Yeah, yeah well we mainly use Jira, 
Um, don't but be the looking. Thing is, it's here is basically documents. Yep. So if you don't put visuals, it's still documents. Exactly. <laughs> and so I got to tell you that people in Atlassian don't use Jira, uh, not for that. They use the walls for that. And uh, people at Atlassian, when I'm talking with them, they say, look, one of the bad behavioral things they're trying to, they want, back to the you can't change users thing, the way the tool is supposed to work is you're supposed to put all the documents in Confluence where you can put photographs and, and uh, videos and uh, rich, more richer things, and then you link your Jira tickets back to Confluence. That's the way they want you to be using it. Um, uh, and they, they're trying to, well, it's one of the behavior changes they're trying to get their users to do. To you. They don't think people use their product right uh, because they put it all in Confluence. They don't put very much in Jira. And you can see by, I can show you a lot more pictures from their environment. They don't use, they don't use Jira or Confluence to have story discussions. You know, you don't have a choice. Uh, and actually, they're running into, if, when I met, the guy I was showing you, one of the guys I was showing you pictures of Confluence, he's one of five product managers. He was one of five product managers for Confluence when I met him. They now have seven and they have a big development office in Vietnam they've just put up and they're running into a lot of, they used to be all co-located in Australia and Sydney and now they've got Sydney and San Francisco and I don't know what city in Vietnam and everybody struggles with it and anyway, but they, uh, at Atlassian, they put the product managers in Vietnam. Uh, they they won't separate the people that decide from the people who build. They, uh, they don't want to deal with the problem. Okay, thank anyway, you very much. Uh, not helpful. I know it's not. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, there's another question in there. I so I got to answer quicker if you still have it. Uh, I have a question. There. How does the, this whole thing scale uh, with multiple teams in multiple locations? We had this already, but uh, how does it scale in, in general with multiple teams? How does uh, which part scale? The, the, the user story, the mapping, the overview about these things, the, the spreading of the things into to the distribution of the things to the teams. Uh, so, so if you have multiple teams working on the product. Uh, I don't know, there's a lot of aspects to that. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there, there, uh, first, first off, full stop, um, uh, you know, you can, uh, everything is easy when you're co-located, it's a small team, yes. okay? You uh, distribute it, it's going to be harder no matter what you do, and it'll be always less perfect. If you distribute it and you scale it to big, it's going to be even worse. It's nothing you can do. So the best you can hope for is it's sort of not sucking too bad uh, kind of thing. Um, I don't know if I can answer any good questions about scaling. Um, I see people using maps for tools, but what I see people using, and I pointed out here, that maps are one of the things we use kind of in discovery to make bigger kind of strategic decisions about cutting up that backlog. And then oftentimes we'll build the map as a visualization and people will go back and reference it so they can see where the story is uh, in the map, but they're usually having these smaller conversations with it. Uh, let me, uh, if I can do a, really see if I can do a quick show and tell, I just want to show you something that's a, uh, one of the things I love about the story maps is, at least if you're face to face, they scale super well. Um, let's drag that on the screen. This is the beginning of a like a it's the beginning of a five day workshop or kind of four and a half day workshop at a company called Pearson Education. If people have heard of them, they're parent companies for. Uh, publishers like Addison Wesley and Prentice Hall and uh, things like that. This is a super boring beginning of a workshop where they have flown the leadership of, I don't know, four or five teams. I lose track uh, and we're doing kind of a, a big kind of a exercise to work together and talk about risks early on. And then this is the beginning of day one and then everybody went home and there is a small core product team that is working together to pull the, trying to get the product backlog out of the, the tool it's in and onto the wall. Now, the, they go through this, uh, we're basically calling them out and people are writing them up on sticky notes so that we can represent the backlog on that wall as a map all the way around. And I killed the sound because it's boring, but I wanted to, uh, I was lucky I kind of got a video of us doing this. They're getting this thing put up. And I was kind of helping facilitate but uh, this is in the evening, there's a small group of people, they've already worked together to build the backlog, but they need to start doing some planning and estimation. Uh, 
we got done late at night, and before we left, we pulled all those sticky notes off the wall, except for what's called the backbone, the top of the map. And I missed the pictures. We have these big piles of sticky notes, and we came in, the whole team came back in, and they, uh, we had them put it all back on the wall. Now I can quiz you and say, well, why would we take it all off, put it on the wall, take it off, take all the time to write it all down, put it all on the wall, take it off the wall, put it in a pile, and then have them put it all back on? You can probably guess. We could have emailed the backlog out to all the developers and said, please read the backlog. But I'm like, that's going to work. Um, but having them do this and ask each other questions, find things, uh, it helps them build some deep understanding. They're all, there are different teams working on different parts and they know their part, but they don't know each other's parts. They don't know the shape of the whole flow. And it's a pretty big thing. It's going to take over a year to build. They go to work and get this on the wall. Then, as they're doing this, they have lots of questions for each other. They start tagging the questions and risks and concerns, and they're going to use all the tagging stuff that they're doing to drive conversations over the next couple days. They're going to break into small groups over the next few days, do story workshopy type things, understand these better so that they can get better estimates and start to gather more data on all those things. And, and so they tag them, and then, even before going into the details, they, uh, the product manager described his release strategy. He says, look, in the first release, we need to be able to achieve these kind of outcomes. It needs to be, we need to ship it, it needs to be able to do this and this. In the second release, we need to expand to this kind of market. And uh, he, people go to work and people move these things up and down in slices themselves. The product owner does not prioritize here. The team prioritizes. The product owner communicates strategy and they all move things up and down. When it's big and on a wall like that and they understand it, that works super well. It gives them really a lot of buy-in. Um, at the end, we get that. Uh, we, they go through lots and lots of conversation. I'm going to show you just a couple more pictures and you guys should be able to get out of here, I think, soon. Look, we are doing estimation. I think some of you guys have done uh, um, t-shirt sizing, large, medium, small, extra large. And they're, they're, they're doing t-shirt sizing directly in the map. And we had the big things at the top of the map I'll call activities. And activities are, uh, if we organize things in the activity, we Basically, everything in there is kind of the same general functional area, and that works. Well, there's an inside joke this team had. Somebody, sometime a long time ago at Pearson, got into somebody's slide deck, and they put kitten photos in the deck. And now, ever since then, they've always used some kind of animal that people have snuck into the meeting. In this particular meeting, the animal is a lizard, because somebody snuck into the... the the thing a lizard and so we're sizing these things but these are lizard sizes I was gonna go forward here uh, there's the lizards I'm sorry that's uh, that is small that is a gecko this is medium that is an iguana this is large that is a Komodo dragon uh, and that's Godzilla that is extra large uh, they equate these to well, a week or less two weeks or less four weeks or less or God knows how long that's gonna take uh, and when you look around at the estimates, these people are kind of moving things around. This is, this, this is how they size this. And again, the map kind of keeps things in a nice order. And uh, when you spread it out big on a wall, you get all that shared understanding stuff. And it, it looks, this backlog has hundreds of items in it. Uh, this is doing relative sizing, so we're, we're not story pointing the whole thing. But the, the map kind of served as kind of a, a structure to hold it. It's probably not the scaling question you uh, asked. But um, the truth is, this, well, this organization found that it was worth flying all these people together in one location for a one-week workshop to plan. And even, you know, big scale, the scaled agile framework or SAFE will talk about a, you know, release planning thing or uh, a quarterly planning where we bring a lot of people together to do it. And they were doing things like that, basically. Any, any specific questions about scaling that uh, I can... Well, would you have multiple product owners uh, basically working with the team, or would you have just one one product owner who has yeah. the? You need multiple product owners. Yeah. The, the, you have you divide up your product into product parts. Areas of product. Yeah, areas of product. But you look for one head of product at Confluence, for example. There are currently seven product managers that uh, run Confluence. One of the product managers is senior, and he is one of the founders of Atlassian, still one of the uh, people that 
runs it, or at least, uh, and sometimes I see a head of product that is, uh, isn't one of the seven, it's, it's an eighth that is called the chief product owner, a head of product, but at Atlassian the founder still manages one part of the product, but he also manages the other six guys and uh, keeps them, it keeps the product coherent. Those people have to be working with each other, they have to be working together as a, a, a one level up team. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not giving short answers. Any other questions? Uh, it's 8.10. Should we call it? We started at 6. That's a couple hours. I'm happy to answer any more questions. We'll do a countdown. Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, so you asked for them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to keep going. I just don't want to keep people here. If they're, uh, you know, I saw a few couple people had to leave, but I. But as you call the middle face, let's call the product discovery. And then I guess you can already guess what the question is. So, so many people with, with product discovery also uh, already consider sorts of validation. Like, for example, you, you mentioned working with mockups or even high level mockups. Yeah. And uh, how about including customers there if you like are going for a mass market? Yeah, that's not validation if you don't. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> as easy as that, but um, you wouldn't do that with the, I guess you wouldn't do that with the user story map, but with no. like the paper prototype or something. Yes, exactly. Well, a paper prototype and actually, you know, that's, well, we could uh, go a lot, uh, spend a lot of time on that in a, in a right. Here comes, here comes the follow-up question. So how do you do time management? Because whenever you invalidate, then your whole schedule for filling the next sprint is at is risk. I do it ahead of, ahead of that. Um, maybe I'll draw the. Um, well, there's a bunch of models to draw. You can't you can't discover do discovery work just in time. Um, okay, that, that's okay. That's the the only thing I wanted to hear because some people actually promote like the the uh, synchronized sprints, like a discovery phase, like two weeks before. It's not a discovery phase. It's a design phase when they do that. Uh, it's my opinion. Uh, if it's if you need to be able to predict, uh, then it's not really discovery. Yeah. Uh, if you really are validating, I'm all with you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think uh, we're of the same mind. But uh, yeah, it's kind of like a drug company scheduling the exploration and discovery of the drug, and then on uh, the Q4 we will then roll out the new drug you've discovered. Uh, the, it, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, you don't construct a plan for that sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? All right. Let's call it. Thanks very much for coming.